So again, my name is Troy Baker. I'm with the Better Business Bureau. Um, we're excited to have this panel together with us uh, as part of our Trust Lab Speaker Series. We're going to focus on cybersecurity today. Uh, before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you're joining us online, we're going to do these presentations with the slide decks and then take questions at the end. So if you have questions for any of our panelists, please put them into the Q&A section or the chat, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation here. Um, so you know we are going to send a slide deck and a copy of this to everybody when it is complete. So expect to see that email. Don't worry about taking a bunch of notes or anything right now. There'll be time for that afterwards. Just be engaged and learn as much as you can. And don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, I do want to introduce our panel and thank them for joining us. So we have Dan Heimler, co-founder and CEO of Watchdog Cyber, a cyber attack mitigation solution provider who will talk about business security. Jessica Duvall, an insurance and risk management advisor with BHS Insurance, who will talk about cyber insurance and key protocols to look for. And Jeff Hoffman, a detective lieutenant with the Michigan Cyber Command Center of the Michigan State Police. He'll talk about the Michigan Cyber Command Center, current cyber threats facing businesses, and some of the things you can do as a business if you do face an, an attack. So we'll start here and work our way down the table. So Dan, we'll start with you. All right, great. Thanks for the intro, Troy. Appreciate it. Appreciate being here with the Better Business Bureau to talk about cybersecurity. Um, so we're gonna give you some tips on what to do and how to stay safe. Uh, me and my partner, we started this business uh, just over three years ago. We've been doing assessments for probably 10 years. What we found was that businesses were not being protected properly. They thought their IT company was doing things for them that they weren't. So we have, uh, we were featured in a MSP Success Magazine. We've also written a few reports to help businesses understand cybersecurity. So really what's going on? Well, 71% of data breaches are happening with less than 100 employees. You only see in the news the big ones, the MGM, United Health, CDK Global. You see the large companies in the news. We don't see the small companies because they don't want to be in the news, and they're really not newsworthy. Um, small businesses become easy targets because they're spending less money on cybersecurity. So we want to be able to help small and medium-sized businesses put the right tools in place and let them uh, help protect their data. Every business has data that a cyber criminal wants because they want to be able to commit uh, identity theft um, and use that data and sell it to um, other people so they can use it. So the unfortunate thing is most businesses that don't have things in place, 60% of those small businesses go out of business within six months of a cyber attack. Um, data breaches are very expensive. And what people don't really realize is that they can't just pay a ransom and move on with their life, with their business. There's a lot of lawsuits that happen, the recovery costs, the remediation costs, um, identity theft protection that they have to put into place. So the costs just start adding up. And customers often will lose customers, businesses will often lose customers um, because of that fact. Because once their information get out, information gets out on the dark web, um, they lose trust in that in that business. So not just, there's an emotional and some anxiety that goes along with having this happen because what we've also seen is companies are not planning for it. So when it happens, it takes a toll on them. Uh, ransomware is a real threat. So basically ransomware is going to encrypt your data. Um, right now, actually data exfiltration is on the rise, which means they're just stealing your data and they will call the people's information that they have, they'll call them, tell them they have it. They'll try to extort money out of them to not release it. Um, and they're gonna extort money out of the business. They like to be paid in, in Bitcoin. So if you don't, if you follow Bitcoin um, right now, it's probably around 90,000 per Bitcoin. Uh, when they ask for 10 or 20 of those, it starts to add up. So downtime right now, the average is 21 days that a business can be down. Um, trying to get back to standard operating procedures. If you're a manufacturing company, um, that could be a world of hurt for you since you're not gonna be able to make anything. Um, so you gotta be careful with that. And again, just mentioned data exfiltration's on the rise. Um, the interesting fact here is the ransom is only 32% 
of the financial impact that an organization will experience. So employees are the weakest link um, right now because they're the ones that are clicking on everything. IBM did a study that 94% of the data breaches that happen um, are because of an employee mistake. Maybe they went and they clicked on a, a phishing email. Um, they maybe answered an email and went and got gift cards and started transferring information, uh, or they just deleted some information out that they shouldn't have. So the mistakes are happening because of them. Security awareness training is a big thing. Right now, insurance companies are starting to request a few different security controls to put in place, and security awareness training is on that list. You want to be able to train your employees on what to look for. Um, they're your first line of defense because they're the ones that are the weakest link. So some best, best practices that you can go through um, just help to protect your company and minimize the um, impact of a data breach. Having secure passwords, use strong passwords, um, 12 characters, upper and lower case characters, um, special symbols. You want to put those in there. Changing your passwords at least every 90 days. There's also some talk now about doing passphrases and having them to be used, which that's still a viable um, option also. Don't post your passwords in plain sight. We've done um, assessments for healthcare facilities, and typically they'll be using multiple people for one computer, and they post a little post-it note with the password on there so people don't forget it. So you gotta be careful, don't leave that out. Consider using a password manager. Um, it's, they're very easy to use and it's very simple. A lot of people think, well, I, now I gotta go change all my passwords. Well, yes, you do wanna make them stronger and a password manager can help you organize them. And then you just have to remember one master password. So that's another good way. And then any account or any site you can turn multi-factor authentication on, you wanna do that because that's another layer that will stop somebody from getting into your accounts. Your credentials could be compromised and on the dark web. Um, and if somebody gets them and tries to log in, but you have multi-factor, you will get notified that they want the code. That means somebody's got your credentials. You'll, you can go in and change that uh, password and log in. So passwords are the key to your networks and your customer information, um, online banking, social media. So you gotta protect that. Data encryption is another big one. So you want to encrypt your data, both at rest and in transit, which means email encryption. A lot of companies we talk to are emailing sensitive information without even thinking about it. Maybe it's an employment application or something that has information on it. They think it's no big deal, email stuff back and forth. You want to make sure that's encrypted, um, even encrypting your mobile device. If you think about going to work at a coffee shop or somewhere where they have Wi-Fi and you've got your laptop there, well, you get up to go get a new coffee and you leave your laptop. Most people just leave it the way it is because they, they're very trusting. Well, somebody could come by and swipe that. If it's not encrypted, they're going to be able to uh, remove that hard drive and get all of your data. Security awareness training is one. It's a big one, right? 95% of the breaches happen because of a, an email. Uh, phishing and ransomware are the, the leading methods of attack. And right now we're going to be coming into the holidays. I highly recommend you keep your guard up because there's going to be so many emails coming through. Last year we saw a record number. And now with AI, they're getting very good. You used to be able to say, oh, you know what? That's a, that password, I, or that email I can tell. There's bad grammar. There's misspellings. No longer with, with AI, that's changed everything. So you want to continually remind your employees we have our program, it's every two weeks, where there's a uh, video and four questions. Uh, it stays top of mind and they get trained on what to look for and how to identify it. Criminals are, cyber criminals are ingesting over 100,000 new malware threats into what we call the wild. And so antivirus is not gonna be able to keep up with that. Um, those are known threats that it can stop. You wanna be able to back up your data, do automated, Automate your backups, test your backups. Don't wait till it's too late, till you need it. You should be testing those. And there's a three, two, one method where you can use, have three copies of your um, data, two different types of media and one kept offsite. Only 6% of companies will survive uh, an attack with a significant data loss after two years. 
So get a risk assessment done. It'll help you understand what risk you have. It'll uncover gaps and vulnerabilities. And then um, it's going to help put in safeguards. You'll have a, a way to do this. Um, you want to evaluate your system. Have a third party do it. If you think your IT guy is doing it, I can guarantee you they're not doing the right things. We see it every single day. Um, most of, most companies don't know how much critical data they have on their computer or their endpoints. We find tax returns all the time and, and other things. So you think your IT person does this? Well, they don't. Think of a doctor, right? Um, an IT personal is, person is more like a general practitioner. They're going to handle the basics of things, the support. I can get on the internet. I can print. I can scan. I can do those things. We're going to be the cybersecurity experts. We're more like the specialists. We know where to look. We know where the cyber criminals are going to try to get into your environment, and we can help stop that. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's Watchdog Cyber. We're going to be able to help you guys. And for being here today, we're going to offer a free risk assessment. So those of you that are online, um, you'll be able to get our information. We'll offer a free risk assessment. You can find out what's going on. And we're going to also offer a 50% off a penetration test. That's a little bit more in-depth. The risk assessment is more of a sampling of what's going on, but you can kind of see what's happening. It'll get you started. Um, there's our contact information for myself and my partner, and that's it for me. Just go down. All right, thank you, Dan, and thank you, uh, Troy and the BBB, for allowing me to, to be here. Um, so, yeah, what do we do next, right? So how do we kind of build on what Dan was saying and – further protect our businesses, um, and that's through cyber insurance. Um, cyber insurance has really evolved um, from being kind of carriers don't know what to do um, and how to handle these, these threat actors. Um, so it sort of has, they've learned, we've, we've ebbed, we've flowed with it. So Cyber AccuView was something that was created in early 20, 2021. Um, insurance carriers kind of came together um, talked through lessons learned to establish these stronger protocols. Um, from that, you know, Dan talked about multi-factor authentication. That was birthed from that. Companies need it. Um, and many cyber carriers wouldn't even offer insurance without MFA. So, um, so that came out of that, um, that data collection and sort of those standards. Um, also what evolved are the applications. So we get a lot of groans when we send applications to, <laughs> to our clients. Um, they do not want to fill out the cyber application. Um, there's a lot of terms on there that are unknown. And that's why I always recommend kind of send it to your, to your IT or to your, um, you know, your cyber risk advisor. Um, and have them help complete these applications. These are warranty applications. So what you fill out on the application is what the carrier is going to take with them when a claim happens. Um, if you claim you have something and you do not, the carrier has the right to deny that claim. Um, and so really be careful when you're completing these. Um, no carrier has the same application. So there's no standard applications. They're all different. Each carrier is looking for different different items on those. So, um, so just being careful when that happens. Um, carriers do do security scans uh, based on websites. They're able to really kind of just do a high level scan of it to check for vulnerabilities. Um, again, that's really evolved since, since cyber insurance started. But, um, and they can also provide proactive alerts. And I think that these are great because um, you really don't know what you don't know. Um, and then when we get those, again, sending those over to your to your IT is is huge. So how do we qualify for cyber insurance? So again, this has also changed. Um, it's a long list, and it looks like a lot of scary words and a lot of things. Um, but again, that's when we look to to Dan and his team to say, okay, are we doing all of these things? Um, can we check all of these boxes? Um, and like I said, a lot of carriers will not quote it or they will they will price you based on what you do have or don't have. Um, they're really gonna take the risk and the exposure that you've opened yourselves up to and price the insurance appropriately. Um, so the big ones that we see are the multi-factor again, 
having that in place has been really key. Um, also, the endpoint detection protection has also been um, something that's ramped up as to what we're needed. And then the response plan. Um, so that response, when something happens, what are we going to do? Who are we going to call? Um, how are we going to manage that has also become important in having that in place. A lot of that really kind of gets lost and we don't know what our plan is. And then staff does not know what the plan is. So that's, again, when I think the training comes, it becomes important as well. So. All right. What is cyber insurance and kind of what does it all entail? Um, it's very different than what you might see on a package policy. So we have our property and we have our general liability and those are all great. Sometimes embedded in that is what's called the data breach expense coverage. Um, this is very bare bones and it is not all very broad like a cyber policy is. Um, it will typically just reimburse you up to the small limit for some expenses. It is not going to manage a lot of that that response that has to be done. So you, your data was taken, you have to notify people about that. Um, when we have that just on a package policy, that's all manned by you. There's no cyber carrier helping you walk through that process, which can be just, you know, unknown. You just don't know how to do it. So that's what our first party coverage is gonna be on our cyber policy. That's our breach response. Um, Public relations, uh, when you have a breach, it doesn't take very long for Facebook to know um, to know about it. So, so it's public relations. Um, legal becomes important. Legal is there to help notify who do we need to even um, tell. There are certain parameters. Each state is different as to who needs to be notified. So having somebody on your team to do that um, gets part of that cyber insurance. The business income, you know, like Dan mentioned, a business can be down for 21 days. I mean, that's revenue that you don't have coming in um, and you you need kind of some help through the um, through the policy for business income. The third party coverage is our really our lawsuits. Right. So if we don't end up doing kind of the first party well, um, those lawsuits can happen um, and they're not going to be cheap. So making sure we have that third party coverage on there. Cybercrime is also something new and evolving. Um, that's going to be social engineering. Uh, it's going to be funds transfer fraud. A lot of that stuff that's going to um, get triggered by a cyber event. So, um, so we have that. Also, what's what we're going to see in a cyber policy versus a package policy is ransomware. So that ransomware piece that we just talked about that cyber insurance is going to help help us in those situations versus that package you know limited coverage that is not going to be included on that so it's it's important to have a full broad cyber policy and i think over time these have become more affordable to the point where you can't even afford not to have one right so to have this separate cyber policy so okay um I think to kind of talk, like kind of just wrap it up here. So risk management practices that I think are key to keep in mind. Um, that training um, is huge. You know, like, like Dan mentioned, human error is still the number one cause. Your staff is clicking on things that they don't even know what they're clicking on. They need to be trained as to what to look for. So I think having that security training Having the phishing simulation, um, you know, sending out an email that um, looks like you are asking for something, the staff clicks on it, it gets them to know what those emails look like. So having your email scanned um, for attachments and links, again, that's going to be kind of done through IT or with for that. Um, and then the incident response plan, like I talked about. Um, is going to be key too. So um, working with leadership to make sure that these are all um, in place is going to be key um, and really is going to put you best of class um, amongst your peers. So asking yourself kind of what is your cyber culture? What does it look like right now? 
Um, and where can we fill in the gaps, right? So um, whether that's through insurance or through um, kind of partnering with someone to help um, find those vulnerabilities. So, and then again, like I said, knowing what you have and what you don't have is going to help price that insurance appropriately. Carriers are going to definitely look to see um, how have we protected ourselves. Um, so, and then price the insurance that way. So, all right. Turn it over to Jeff. A little technical difficulties. We're, I think we're good now. So Jeff Hoffman, a lieutenant with the state police. I've uh, been with the state police for a little over 25 years, and I'm an assistant commander with the cyber section. And uh, with cyber section, we have the MC3, which is the Michigan Cyber Command Center, which is tasked with network intrusion investigations and cybersecurity in general um, for the whole state of Michigan. Um, our cyber section also encompasses the computer crimes unit, which we have eight offices around the state, lower peninsula, upper peninsula, but the actual cyber command center is based out of Lansing and covers uh, the entire state. So with that is uh, the MC3, the main tasks of the MC3 include network intrusion investigations and forensics. Um, every incident of malware, ransomware, uh, stolen identities, hacking is a crime in Michigan. Although a lot of the times these crimes happen from outside the state of Michigan, facilitated by the internet, they're still a crime and we still like them to be reported or at least know about them so we can help better protect the networks within the state of Michigan and help victims um, before the crimes even happen potentially. So with that, uh, we do dark web investigations. There's been many times where we have a dark web analyst who just monitors the dark web or we use tools to monitor the dark web and we'll find the information out about a data breach or a victim within the state of Michigan, a school, healthcare, a business, and we will proactively reach out to them and let them know. You might not be aware, but your information is already on the internet, and they're finding out from us that they've been a victim of a cyber crime before they even realize it, and their information is already out there on the internet or the dark web. Uh, we'll, we, would, we do conduct cyber security assessments. Uh, with uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security through CISA, uh, tools they provide to provide cybersecurity assessments. We conduct threat analysis and information sharing. I'll provide uh, an email address if you're interested in receiving some information from us. We won't flood your emails uh, with too much information, but we send out things once or twice a week um, with threat analysis and information sharing for cybersecurity. And then training and outreach. We will come out, provide just like today's session, uh, we'll come out to small, medium businesses, public, private sector, critical infrastructure, and provide cybersecurity training uh, for those interested. Th threats and trends. We've already talked to them a little bit today. Uh, ransomware. That's obviously when your information, your your network is compromised, and a threat actor takes your data. They encrypt your data locally on your machines after they've already stolen data from you. We laugh every time we see on the news that an organization becomes a victim of cyber security or of a ransomware incident and uh, the lawyers, no offense to any lawyers in the room here, are quick to say, you know, no evidence that any data has been taken. Where we know if they ransomware your, your local endpoints, they've already got what they want. So chances are they took a lot of your data and that's the whole point of doing the ransomware so that they can come back and try to collect money from you. Uh, current, with the current threats and trends, Business email compromises us right up there with ransomware. We hear about ransomware from big companies in the media. Uh, we don't necessarily hear a, a lot about it from the smaller entities across the state. The you know the smaller shops, less than 100 people, less than you know 50 employees. Uh, but business email compromises. That's when a threat actor gets into your email account or an email account of someone you trust and you're doing business with, and then they use a legitimate email string to then they'll spoof that email address of whoever they compromised and they'll use what's a one-off name or a typo squatted name. So it looks just like their email domain, except for one letter might be different or there might be an extra period in there and use a subdomain that looks like it. And they carry on a conversation with you saying, hey, we know this $100,000 transaction is, you know, you owe us $100,000. We're getting audited or some other reason and we need this money to go to this bank account instead. 
And a lot of times unsuspecting victims from the corporation or business that needs to make that payment knows this payment is due. And if, hey, if our customer's saying it needs to go to this other account, we know we need to pay them. So we'll change it to this other account and they make the payment. And then it's 30, 60, 90 days later before they realize, hey, where'd the money go? Well, you asked it to go to this one. We never asked for that. Yeah, here's the email. Well, this email came from someone else, not really from us. And by then, a lot of times it's too late to get the money back. Um, with other things, it's other types of malware, payroll scams, gift card scams. And a lot of these can be stopped in their tracks with employee training. Because like it was already talked about is the employee is the weakest link. Uh, a lot of times it's you know trying to take shortcuts or something free and easy. The free route is normally going to cause you headaches down the road. Trying to search for a document to use as a go-by for a free you know, example of a, doc, of a contract or something when you're downloading those free uh, documents or free files, that's what's going to open up your business to malicious threats. We already talked about uh, the gift card scams. So that's where they're going to try to get your employees to go out and buy gift cards. It's a quick, easy buck for these threat actors. But payroll direct deposit scams, same thing, but a little bit more income for them is trying to get payroll direct deposit changed to an account they control. Hopefully you have uh, procedures in place. Anything that deals with finance, anyone in your businesses that has any control over the money, they need to have heightened awareness for security. Any kind of change, any request for change, needs to be followed up with. And this is an area where AI is gonna make things more difficult for the security of your business and of finance because threat actors are gonna to start to use the AI and impersonate people, not just their voices, but you'll be able to create a video and make it look like it's a legitimate person that you, know, that you think you know and trust. And you hop on a video call and say, hey, was this $100,000 million dollar payment authorized to be moved? or to be made. And with AI, they're going to be able to impersonate people, say, yep, absolutely. We had a change in the contract. We need to, to make this payment. And you're going to be looking at someone. So anytime finances are changed, you need to have a heightened awareness for security purposes and follow up, whether it's in person, a known phone call out of band, not just a, a link that's already or a communication channel that's already established. So you know you're making uh, the approved changes to anything. Other malware, which typically will lead to ransomware or a business email is compromised. But a lot of times this malware comes from clicking links in emails or clicking on free things on the internet, drive-by downloads, you're at a website and it has a, has a pop-up for an update. You know, you need to update your web page for this, you know, click this link. And that just opens the door for a threat actor to get into your network. When we talk about phishing, uh, different types of phishing. There's the general phishing we all get. We get phishing in our emails, which are hopefully easy for a lot of us to to spot these days. There's spear phishing, which is that's targeted phishing where they know who their victim is. They're going after a specific victim. Um, they're and these are a lot more specific, but they typically involve a lot more money, and they end up with business email compromises or perpetrated from business email compromises. Uh, whaling is a term that's used now. It's spear phishing used at basically your CEOs or people with a lot of money because they're the whales, uh, senior executives. Smishing is the text message phishing. Hope, I don't know if everyone here has had it, but I've seen an increase in that over the last year or so of you get random text messages of, hey, your package was delivered and if, you know, or it's, it's waiting to be delivered, you need to click here to accept the, the package. And then they try to get you to sign in and they're, they're after your username and your passwords is what it comes down to. And vishing is the same thing, but with the telephone calls. And with AI, we're going to see more of this. It's going to be what sounds like maybe a trusted voice, because with only a few minutes of or a few sentences of, of words from a person or a few minutes of video, with AI, you can create videos and recordings that sound just like the person these days. And it's going to be much more difficult to spot. So that's uh, the cybersecurity and network or the current trends in a nutshell. Uh, MC3, if you have a cybersecurity incident, we will respond to investigate it as a, a criminal event. That's what we're there for is to collect some evidence and to help work with our partners. 
a lot of our federal partners, the FBI, Homeland Security, Secret Service, because these crimes do happen across state lines and international boundaries. Most of these crimes are happening, coming from outside the USA, and it has a financial aspect, whether they're trying to get bank, bank transfers. We see people try to tell their victims being told to package up money, wrap it up in tin foil, take it to UPS and ship it out. That happens. Or they're using cryptocurrency, which you know is a little more difficult to trace. It can be traced to some extent, depending on where it goes. But anytime you're the victim of a cyber crime as a business, uh, we ask you to report it. You can send emails to mc3 at michigan.gov. Uh, we also ask you to re report any kind of cyber crime to the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center, which is ic3.gov. It's www.ic3.gov. Um, just so we have a better understanding of the types of crimes that are happening out there. So when we come to talk to and better educate uh, entities within the state, they can be better prepared for any kind of cyber incident. On the resources, like I said before, we have michigan.gov forward slash MC3, which MC3 is short for Michigan Cyber Command Center. Uh, you can send an email to MC3 at michigan.gov and ask to be put on our mailing list and we'll send out, we typically send out one to two emails a week with relevant information um, going on in the cybersecurity world. And then if you have an interest in a cybersecurity assessment, we can help, maybe help facilitate that. And then cybersecurity awareness training also, those can all be requested by sending an email to mc3 at michigan.gov. Other than that, that is all I have. Who am I passing the mic back to? All right, thank you. I actually have a question for you because we've talked about this before. Um, I'm a small business or a large business and I'm, so I, I get attacked and I want to report it to Michigan State Police. But I don't want everybody finding out that I got attacked. These are not FOIAable, right? Yes, that was one of the roadblocks we came across. Go ahead and grab the, the mic there. I'm not sure if it picked me yeah. up from over there. So that's one of the roadblocks we came across when the MC3 was standed up, stood up over 10 years ago, was FOIA. Being state police, being law enforcement in Michigan, were subject to FOIA. Uh, the legislator did put in protections for FOIA for cybersecurity information. So anything that's cybersecurity related is exempt from FOIA and will not be released. So if an entity makes a report for a cybersecurity incident, we take make a police report out of it, do an investigation, none of that information would be disclosed uh, due to that. Um, Through the that Freedom of Information in, Act. In FOIA, Freedom so, of Information Act. So don't worry. If you make a report, don't worry that everybody's going to find out that Michigan State's here dealing with this through the Freedom of Information Act. That's not part of, you've got some protection there. Um, we talked about passwords and if we can bring up the, the slide here, this data is, we were talking about this beforehand, this data is a little outdated now, but when you look at it, um, you talk about what you should have in a good, strong password. Uh, and I joke at a lot of these, my dad used to work in computers many decades ago and he had to, he'd have to change his password every month. And it would be Lion01 for January, Lion02 for February, Lion03 for March. He'd just change the number at the end. That is not a secure way your passwords. If scammers find out that you're using Lion04, they're gonna try five, six, seven, and eight till they hit the right one. But when you look at the chart, the more you can put into your passwords, the more complex they are, the longer it takes to actually crack these. And while some of these timelines seem like they're ridiculous, you know, millions of years, know that every year those numbers come down and down. So this data is probably outdated um, because they are doing better at cracking these. But you see how just adding extra characters, upper, lower, more characters to it makes a huge difference in your passwords. Yes, the one thing you don't want to do with passwords is reuse passwords. We talked about password managers earlier. So anytime you're using a password, you only want to use one password, one service. You don't want to use the same password for your email that you use for your banking, that you use for your healthcare, that you use for your credit card, because that's the first thing threat actors are going to do is try to test those passwords to see where they're being reused at across multiple accounts. So how do you store multiple different passwords? Like was mentioned earlier, is a password manager and then also enable multi-factor authentic authentication. 
And, and a reminder, if you do have questions online, uh, go ahead and put them into the chat of the Q&A. One question we often get from businesses, especially small businesses, is I'm a small business. I've got, you know, maybe I'm just operating everything off a laptop at home, or I've got one computer at the front desk and one in the back for the manager. Do I really need to worry about this? Dan, do you want to? Sure. Um, well, absolutely, you need to worry about that. Um, multiple passwords, uh, multiple sites, people using the same password for is not is not acceptable. Um, so they have to have those separated. You still have information. We've had three breaches, um, three customers this year that were solopreneurs. Thought I don't have information here. Why do I got to do this? And one of them ended up paying out twenty thousand dollars. So. Uh, it doesn't matter how small you are. You need to follow best practices because the less in, the less security controls you have in place, the more opportunity for them to get into you. And what about cybersecurity insurance? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's important for businesses of all size because again, it's going to be costly. And that is not something that you probably have in your budget for the year. Um, and having the insurance policy there to help mitigate that cost um, is going to be huge. So again, I don't think it matters the size. Um, those threat actors are not biased about big businesses, small businesses. Um, typically, we see it small businesses hit more than even the large businesses um, because again, I think they know that not all the protections are in place, um, like some of those large organizations have. Um, so I do, I do think insurance coverage for everybody is important. Um, that million dollar policy or half a million dollar policy is going to be key in those situations. So, and like I said, it, cyber insurance has become more costly. So what you think is, you know, a, a big hit on your, um, your insurance program is not the case. You know, you're going to see that when you get hit by a, you know, a ransomware attack um, and those dollars are going to add up very, very quickly. So, and again, the hit on your business revenue because of that also is going to play a factor in it too. So while it may cost you a lot of money to even manage the situation, now you're also losing, you know, important revenue while that's all taking place. So, yeah. Yep. You mentioned a, a half million or million dollar policy. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that's a lot of money. Well, how am I going to spend? Why would I need that much coverage? I can tell you from the investigation side and working with cyber response companies and insurance companies that when you have an event like ransomware and you think I can possibly need a half million or million dollar policy, well, when that's activated, not only are you paying for outside entities to come in and review your data and see how much data was leaked or when the information is eventually posted on the dark web, because if you're not paying a ransom or even if you pay a ransom, they still may very well post that information. Then someone still has to go through it, see what was leaked, notify victims, do victim notifications. You might be a business in the state of Michigan, but if you have customers outside of the state of Michigan, you might fall under their state laws and have to do breach notification um, things. So they hire attorneys for you. We all know attorneys are expensive. And those, those premiums are not the premiums, but the amounts of coverage will get used up very quickly. So you might think it's only half a million dollars. It's, I'm never going to use that much. But when you're having to pay for uh, credit insurance or credit monitoring for 100, 1,000, 10,000 people, all your customers for the past 20 years, it can get very expensive very quickly. Yeah, if you can hand the microphone to Jessica here, I do have a question because we were talking beforehand about coverages and claims being denied. I think a lot of businesses may see the list of things they need to do. And in some cases be tempted to say, ah, we're close. Let me just check that mm -hmm. box. In that case, you might be paying for insurance you never actually get to use, right? Correct, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, I go back to the fact that that application, it becomes very important because that is your, that's your warranty on the policy. Um, Cause yeah, to Troy's point, it, you need to make sure that you've talked to somebody about whether or not you have it. Um, because when the event takes place, the carrier is going to take their forensic team and take a look at what happened. 
um, and say, well, this wasn't in place. You you didn't have the multi-factor like you you noted you did. And that's how that cyber um, threat actor got in. Um, and so that the carrier likely could deny that claim. So yes, it is very important. Um, and as I mentioned before, being truthful on that application, the carrier is going to look at it. They're going to underwrite it appropriately. Um, isn't necessarily going to mean that you're not going to get coverage, right? I mean, so I think it's it's more important to have that that application be completed accurately um, than just kind of guess on those answers. So yes, yep. All right. So we have a question from online. How can I use AI device to stay ahead of the game when it comes to cybersecurity? to take that one okay so the question is how can i use an ai device yes i guess it would depend on what they're talking about as an ai device but threat actors are going to continually try to advance and stay ahead of the curve Cybersecurity, a lot of times is reactionary is trying to prevent things from happening instead of actively looking the more advanced organizations are actively looking for threats on their network um, but trying to leverage AI in some form or fashion, whether it's through an endpoint detection response, uh, which is next generation antivirus, um, or using it for security purposes, looking through logs would be a, a good way to use AI. Um, but ultimately, it's making an investment in cybersecurity and thinking about cybersecurity and taking it seriously, because it's the entities that don't make an investment are the ones that end up getting burned the most. And and a lot of this. You talk about being proactive. Dan, talk a little bit about the cybersecurity assessment you were talking about and that proactive standpoint of finding out where your weaknesses are so you can fix them now. Sure. So the assessment really looks at areas that a cyber criminal looks at for a way to get into a, uh, an environment. And there's a misconception out there with a lot of business leadership that we've seen thinking they think that their IT person is doing all this stuff. And unfortunately, they're not. They're making things work. So you have to be continually monitoring and looking at your systems because IT is making changes. Let's say you have a problem with, I can't print. Well, they change something. Uh, my email is not working. Well, then they go in and change something. If they change that, if they whatever they change to make it work, they may have changed something on the back end that leaves that company vulnerable. So there should be some type of assessment or some type of testing that's always looking for those gaps in security or those vulnerabilities. Without that, you could go months, quarters, a year with a lot of changes, and then all of a sudden there's all these vulnerabilities that have popped up and no one recognized them. All right, so let me ask this. We hear about the big ones you know, in the news, but from a, from a small business standpoint, really how common are these attacks? They're happening all the time. That's the majority of the business that are being hit because they don't have anything uh, in place. Think about a criminal that is uh, driving down a neighborhood road and he sees a home and that home has a nice tall fence. It's got a gate at the uh, driveway. It's got motion detectors. There's floodlights out there. There's a couple of German shepherds running around the yard. That criminal is going to keep driving. And when they find the house that has the garage door open, there's no lights on, there's no fence, there's nothing. Which one do you think they're gonna go for? And typically the small and medium-sized businesses are that home that has nothing around it. And those are the ones that are getting attacked. The, the one point I wanna make too is the four nation states, China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran, those are where most of these attacks are coming from. And the average annual household income is $30,000 a year. So if they can get $5,000 out of you or $2,000 or $10,000, that's huge for them. It doesn't always have to be the million dollar hit or the half a million dollar hit. These people are going after people without security controls in place and they're going after small businesses because they know they're gonna pay. There are probably people that are thinking, yeah, but I don't really have anything that they, that they want. What I, I own a muffler shop, what kind of, what kind of things are they going to get from me? What are these bad actors looking for out of some of these small businesses? Maybe it's a construction company or something like that. 
Well, you have to think of their customer data, right? So you've got people's names, addresses, phone numbers. You have credit card information you could have. Um, your own employees, you've got uh, hiring data. So you've got social security numbers. You have banking information. You're sending um, direct deposit. You have that information. It just adds up. And people think, well, I really don't have anything. I don't know if they really think about what they typically have on their laptops or on their computers or in their systems. So those are the things that they're looking for. So one question from online um, from somebody we know um, says, I can appreciate the state taking measure to make sure my incident isn't foyable. Would it make sense to have some type of platform that would log an attack on a small medium business that de-identifies the business, only keeping track of the type of attack, uh, the vertical the business is in, the size of the business, et cetera, um, to provide people an understanding, it sounds like, of what is happening without specifically identifying that business? Yes, and that's somewhat what you can do through making a report with the FBI at the IC3 website, because they will ask, uh, all those all those questions, the size, the employees, um, all that information, the amount of loss, the type of loss, and that is those are all not linked to the state of Michigan and not subject to FOIA results. Those are all watered down, and they include those in the national um, yearly reports. So that is one platform to do that. Other than that, we simply don't have the means right now to be able to stand up something like that just for the state of Michigan. So we ask, we always ask people that, that come into this report it. What is the value in reporting it to something like uh, IC3? It's helping others in your community, in your state, in the country to help uh, make us aware of what's going on. When these attacks start happening, someone's the first of, a, of some type of attack and then they spread. And until we become aware of them as law enforcement, uh, in the cybersecurity community to be able to talk about them and educate other people. Um, that's when it starts gaining traction is to be able to stop it is so we understand what's going on so we can spread the word uh, to other others just like you today on what's going on out there and what do we need to do to stop it. Fantastic. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I really do appreciate each of you joining us. Um, we will have this information all online. Uh, the video as well, we'll have a follow-up email with all of their contact information um, so that you can reach out to them uh, and learn more about how this can uh, help your business be prepared in the event of a cyber attack. Uh, thank you for joining us today.